One common assumption about adaptation is that it is a dilution, a paler copy of an experience, no matter the intentions of the creators. Yet Paul Webb's score for Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, does not distill. It bears no resemblance to Michael Kamen's lushly orchestrated film score of the same year. Though Webb's material is original, its textures and voice leadings suggest Renaissance roots, anachronistic for the context of the Crusades, but alluding to Elizabethan airs and instrumental dances in a way that echoes the identification of Robin Hood with England. Implying the Middle Ages in the Ludo musical context, or indeed in any modern medium, is often about constructing a version of the past that sounds the way people think it may have sounded, or that echoes familiar depictions of the era in film and television, rather than striving for historical accuracy. Webb's choices throughout the game are vibrant, clever, and fitting. Although the score inspires a great deal of inquiry, let us focus in this paper on three stars in the constellation of issues surrounding this ludic adaptation. First, we will examine this peculiar brand of transmedial adaptation from film to game. Then we will explore the curious anachronism of Renaissance music to create a medievalist rather than medieval score, to use John Haynes' term. Beyond these tendencies to collapse the distant past musically for aesthetic ends, we will also discuss the technical considerations that make Renaissance music better suited to games of this era than monophonic chant, Gullard songs, or the polyphonic organa of Leonin and Periton. The process of ludic adaptation builds on an inherent tension between the player's recognition of the source material and the deliberate distancing from the source that the game needs to perform in order to succeed in its new medium. In surveying the adaptation literature, I was particularly drawn to Mark Rell Wallen's work on the Lord of the Rings games and authorship. As Wallen puts it, we can think of adaptation, quote, in terms of identification and division. In a 2007 article on authorship, he speaks to these divergences more directly as a consequence of the medium. Quote, the game retains its own internal coherence by adding plot elements to the story. Quite simply, given the conventions of the medium, a faithful or moment-by-moment -moment accounting of the film plot would have rendered the game adaptation less viable as an adaptation, end quote. Henry Jenkins echoes this notion in Game Design as Narrative Architecture, asserting that adaptations tend to strive above all to evoke a work's atmosphere, not its events. The most interesting aspect of ludic adaptation for our purposes here is the way that the source material itself confers authority on the new text. Publishers must grapple with notions of authenticity in the adaptation process, searching for a balance between vying for legitimacy and providing genuine gratifying gameplay experiences to the players. Wallen writes, overt connections with their sources achieve the effect of providing authorship to an otherwise unauthored text. That is, the audience's desire for an author figure must be fulfilled, and so video game publishers have chosen, to, chosen their models to act as authors of the text. But how can a text be the author of another text? Wallen's last points here are well taken, particularly in light of my source. Robin Hood has no authoritative version, no singular text upon which all new forms are based. The earliest surviving appearance of Robin Hood is in 1377, and it wasn't even a starring role. William Langman made an offhand remark about the popularity of the rhymes of Robin Hood. That's all we get. Not much of an origin story here. As Thomas Leitch writes, from his earliest surviving starring roles in ballads written sometime after 1450, Robin Hood is an anti-authoritarian trickster who robs from the rich, usually corrupt bishops and abbots but he does not start giving to the poor until his 16th century incarnations, which also make him more respectable by giving him an aristocratic pedigree as the former Robin of Loxley. Robin Hood's well-known status as a Saxon patriot resisting illegitimate Norman rule dates from a French study as late as 1830. Knight and Olgren describe the Robin Hood legend as both fugitive and flexible. Greta Austin seems to be able to forgive the mutability and flagrant anachronisms of the myriad adaptations. She does not fall to film for cite it, failing to cite its sources, as it were. She writes, films are historical studies with the footnotes omitted. Needless to say, written records and modern narrative accounts also elide, compress, and alter the unknowable. What really happened, history as it really was. Consequently, the Middle Ages and the movies are often modernity in drag. Therefore, Austin might agree with Leitch's argument that the most authoritative versions of Robin Hood exist in modern films, not the literary sources. In fact, the only source that he cites as influential is Howard Pyle's The Merry Adventures of Robin Hood of Great Renown in Nottinghamshire from 1883, but it is for the visuals rather than the narrative. 
The illustrations in this volume gave us Robin Hood's iconic pointed hat, jerkin, and quiver full of arrows. Leitch treats Robin Hood as something akin to a genre, referring to films as, quote, ad hoc source texts. Both genres and Robin Hood ad adaptations establish rules that are never definitively articulated by any single example, but derived from a wide array of texts in some unspecified way. This notion is useful for our purposes because the NES adaptation of Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, is strikingly distinct from the film, seeming to take a similarly unspecified ghostly inspiration from its source, leading to divergences in the graphics as the sprites of Morgan Freeman and Kevin Costner have shown, and in the music. Compare this brash snippet of Michael Kamen's overture To this moment from Paul Webb's score for the level at Dubois Manor, which sounds less like an adventurous orchestral theme and more like a folk dance or Elizabethan air with a strong modal feel. In this case, a simple G Dorian tune that flips us from minor to major at the cadence. <laughs> These divergences are due in large part to the concurrent development of the film and game. The film came out on June 14, 1991, and the game was released in November of the same year. As Paul Webb told me in an interview, he saw the film well after he'd already finished all of the music for the game. We developed the game before the, the movie came out. I mean, I'd never seen the movie, I'd never heard the score, I had no idea what it was going to be like. You know, so I just didn't. I did something that made sense to me, and that's, that was about it. And then, uh, uh, I put them too close together, apparently. And then I went and saw the movie and said, oh, that's the kind of music they did. That's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> One place we might you expect to see more direct influence of historical texts is in the music of an adaptation. After all, we do have notated music surviving from 1194 when Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves takes place. And yet, Cayman's score sounds more antique cinema than ours antiqua, hearkening back to classic Hollywood scores of Korngold and Steiner. And Paul Webb's score, to paraphrase a series of emails between Graham Boone and I, throws out some characteristic rhythms, melodies, harmonies, counterpoint, and ornamentation of Renaissance forms without any direct quotation. This anachronism does not derive from the film, nor is it unique to Robin Hood adaptations. As Karen Cook's chapter on the music of Civilization IV makes abundantly clear, quote, the medieval era includes a diverse, diverse tracks ranging from chant to a cappella vocal pieces to 17th century secular music played by recorders or viols, end quote. She describes how Soren Johnson, the lead designer for the game, quote, based the musical selections largely on his own tastes, aiming to choose pieces that complemented each other in terms of dynamic range, timbre, style, and so forth, end quote. Of course, Chasing a desired sound is a viable strategy in creating a compelling and unified score. But why use the music of the Renaissance to score a game set during the Crusades? The specific flavor of anachronism, the conflation of medieval and Renaissance, was hardly an invention of modern media. This is not where we developed a taste for it. John Haynes demonstrates in music in films on the Middle Ages, quote, widespread from around 1500 onward were anthologies known as romanceros that were eclectic collections bringing together medieval songs and contemporary folk songs, end quote. So in essence, he argues that the iconic musical moments that define medieval films, quote, combine a little authenticity in the form of carefully chosen bits of historical evidence and a lot of fantasy, a complex cinematic world based, consciously or not, on a medievalist tradition that predates the earliest films by some 400 years, end quote. Haynes divides his chapters according to the most common aural symbols of the medieval in film, such as church bells and chant representing religious ritual and the supernatural, horn calls establishing a pastoral mood, trumpet fanfares representing chivalric ideals, court and dance music, and songs by a singing minstrel or troubadour. 
A few of Haynes's aural symbols of medievalist film scoring are particularly pertinent to Paul Webb's score. For example, Webb writes several short transitional fanfares. The very first sound you hear when you turn on the game. The celebratory small victory. The fanfare for the Virgin Games Presents screen. And the fanfare when you advance to the next level, among others. Michael Kamen's main theme evokes the same potent symbol, focusing on sprightly leaps of fourths and fifths for the main theme. I apologize, that's not the right clip. I have it. Pop under the hood here for a second. This one. Of course, the medievalist tradition completely fabricated these aural images of royal trumpeters. As Haynes reminds us, quote, for the most of the Middle Ages, horns produced one note and trumpets only four, a main pitch, an octave, a twelfth, and a fifteenth above it. These intervals, intervals were simply not possible on any horns extant from the Middle Ages. Webb's track for Loxley's castle seems to take inspiration from a sort of improvisatory dance form with a ground bass. The motion of the bass line, in this case given in Pulse Channel 2, follows a similar contour to a 16th century Passamezzo Antico progression, though it's not an exact replication of the pattern. However, these kind of repeating ground bass patterns represent one of Webb's most salient aural links to the music of the Renaissance throughout the Prince of Thieves score. The game over track takes the lament bass pattern of a descending Phrygian tetrachord as its model, also given in Pulse Channel 2 here, with a slight extension serving as a kind of coda to give the track weight and finality, since it did not loop in game. But it certainly calls upon the pattern to evoke sorrow and tragedy. What we might expect to hear of authentic music in the score is chant, whether in the form of the evil medieval, as James Deville has famously dubbed it, or as a representation of devout worship. Chant is the largest extant corpus of music from the Middle Ages, after all. However, we don't even get the beginnings of notation until two-thirds of the way through the Middle Ages, and deciphering the notes and rhythms of Carolingian chants have tended to require comparison of various later exemplars and descendants to sort out the relative stability in a chant's transmission. Scoring secular medieval scenes with chant merely to pay lip service to historical accuracy, rather than to capture the emotion and pacing of a scene, feels incongruous and ultimately reductive. And as Haynes remarks, no modern audience could stomach an orchestral underscore that was entirely monophonic, nor even one made up of parallel fifths. Apparently he hadn't played a lot of games from the 70s and 80s, but we'll forgive him for that. As Miklos Rosa remarked of his heavily researched score for Quo Vadis from 1951, one had to avoid the pitfall of producing only musicological oddities instead of music with a universal emotional appeal. The prevalence of the Renaissance's medieval musical model is due not only to the lack of extant sources for non-liturgical music, it also encompasses issues of musical preference and the establishment of stylistic convention in early Hollywood. From there, it was a process of influence and accretion, or as Wallen described it, text serving as authors for new texts. Prince of Thieves is set in 1194, roughly at the end of the Middle Ages, so one could make the argument that a Renaissance inflected sound is just as appropriate to the era as chant. And it turns out, the music of this period is a personal favorite of Paul Webb. I'm a huge fan of uh, early music, you know, medieval Renaissance music, so I just listen to it a lot. One of my favorite musical groups is the Talus Scholars, 
who not surprisingly do a lot of Thomas Pell's music and a lot of other, uh, you know, music of that period. Um, a lot of the music I listen to is actually uh, like uh, choral music of the period. Mm -hmm. But I do listen to a lot of lute music as well. But it is not merely a stylistic preference that shaped Webb's decisions to include this music in the score. When we were discussing his compositional process in the 8-bit era, he spoke at several points about the difficulties of translating one's musical ideas into assembly language, how much he had to play around with different combinations on his MIDI keyboard in order to find something that would work well with the capabilities of the sound chip, and then he would go back to the machine and continue to refine until the output of the code was as close to the intended sound as possible. With the NES, and especially with even earlier game uh, platforms, um, you know, a composer could, could compose some kind of music, but it, that, there's no guarantee that that would translate well onto the limits of what the, what the uh, actual sound chip could do. There are several reasons that I would argue that Renaissance is a better fit on the NES than unmetered Gregorian chant or a piece by Michaud. Metrical freedom and irregularity is difficult to encode, and it also has a meandering, timeless quality that may make it less motivating to the player traversing the levels of the game. Ground or lament bass lines resonate beautifully with the looping aesthetic cultivated in the 8-bit era, and the sound channels of the console fit the textures found in Renaissance polyphony, melody, harmony, and bass with occasional percussion in the more active battle themes. But these seeming limitations forcing the composer into anachronistic stylistic choices even if those choices are grounded as much in Haynes' medievalist tradition as in the sound chip, are features, not bugs, resonances rather than restraints. The clever programmer or composer can use the capabilities of the system to create intricate, innovative timbres and textures. What was most striking to me in the score is Webb's use of the timbral possibilities of the triangle channel to imply unpitched percussion, despite apparent harmonic clashing with the upper voices. As we can see here from this track, which I'm playing here because it was never used in the final game, the triangle channel matches the rhythm of the noise channel's percussion. But if you isolate the channel in audio overload or another program, you can hear that it's clearly pitched, although it is soft and dynamic and very low in register. There are several more examples of this process throughout this soundtrack, so Webb clearly enjoyed the effect he produced. I would argue that all of these sounds, all of these sound completely natural until you pull apart the voices for transcription. That the triangle channel seamlessly supports rather than contradicts its upper voices is a testament to Webb's process and knowledge of the system. At first blush, this score seems a little out of place, both as an adaptation and as an early 1990s video game score for the NES. Adaptations can seem like a photocopy run through the machine one too many times, faded ink on a page. Yet medieval films and games, and adaptations of Robin Hood stories in particular, seem to breathe new life into the myth each time instead of retreading the same tired paths. What's more, Webb's material eschews the scope and grandeur of Wagnerian flecked film scores in favor of simpler fare from the medievalist tradition, a refreshing choice after nearly a century of swashbuckling, but one that deeply engages with our construction of the way we think and feel the Middle Ages sounded. Webb's score does not simply recognize resonances between the Renaissance and the ideal textures of the sound chip. In translating airs into assembly language, he created something remarkably idiomatic for the NES. Thank you. And we do have time for questions. What's, what's he doing now? You know, he's, uh, he's working in software, but he has completely left composition. I tracked him down on LinkedIn, sent an email. He has signed up for the free trial to send him an email. Uh, <laughs> I don't use LinkedIn. But uh, I was surprised when he responded to me, and he's like, uh, actually, one of my favorite clips from the interview, he, he went, when you sent me the email, I went, did I do that game? And then he <laughs> went on YouTube and pulled it up, and actually, just really quickly, this is one of my favorite moments in the whole interview. People actually listen to this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like 
an interrogation technique or something? <laughs> so he was really surprised that I tracked him down and that I was listening. And when I told him I had transcribed the entire score, he, was, he asked me to send it to him. So, <laughs> yeah, so he, he's doing um, programming, but I can't remember exactly what company, what, what he's doing, but he's out of sound design completely. I guess I'll ask a question about uh, authenticity, which did come up on the Twitter feed a little bit. Uh, and and we've, we've actually seen this in previous NACFAGUMs, the question of, does it matter if a, a game that takes place in a particular era uses the music from that era, uh, and is it a problem if it doesn't? Well, you know, I, I sort of skirt around that a little bit at the end here, where I'm like, well, we're almost at the Renaissance, so it's not totally, totally out of, uh, out of context here. Um, but I, I did, you know, the, we, we can notice how the, the Renaissance is almost always used as, um, like, it, it's interchangeable with the surviving chant. And as Will points out in his forthcoming book, you know, they, there's a sense of just, it, it implies oldness to us. Um, the sound is distant enough that we, we get the message. Um, so does it work? Yes. Um, but would I also love to see a game that was completely accurate, you know, in, in asking a musicologist uh, for the sound design tips and, you know, encoding real music that's exactly appropriate to the era? Of course, you know, if it's done well, it's done well. But authenticity, I think, can not matter if what they put in its place works. Yeah. So, but on the flip side of that, aren't we just privileging notes on a page if we're looking for authenticity? Because there's literally no way we could have anything like an authentic, giant scare quotes, timbre on the NES. So, isn't it in a sense weird to want authenticity out of notes and not care if we get authenticity out of timbre? Um, or, I don't know, is, are those just totally separable issues? Hmm. It's, it's hard for me to get mad at the NES for not matching the timbre. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm not in any way implying that we should be mad at the NES. I'm, I'm, suggesting that, <laughs> I'm suggesting that isn't it sort of strange of those of us who, and I'm in this camp, who are thinking, yeah, wouldn't it be cool to have an authentic medieval score that sounds like bleep, 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 um, which is a sound that would have made no sense to mm -hmm. people in, in 1200. Um, and recognizing that our performance practice is also, you know, situated in our time and place, and the, the slim recordings, kind of that, that, that timeless feel of chant right. is something we've invented, too. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so there has to be recognition that, you know, authenticity has, uh, in the, throughout the paper, it has scare quotes. So authenticity is a, is a dangerous, spiky word. Hi. Hey, Dana, thank you. Um, I'm, this question of authenticity and style stuff is really interesting, and I guess you, you mentioned briefly the sort of ways that the Cayman score goes back to so Hollywood models, and you mentioned Korn, Gold, and Steiner, and I think, there's, I think there's more there to develop and play with because of the way this is a somewhat remarkable score, that it's, it's going past that. And it's reminding me more of some of the things like the Roja epic scores in the yes. 50s where you know, there were budgets and efforts on Roja's part to study early music and try to incorporate that stuff into it. And it, 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 so this is reminding me more of that, but just thinking the context of not like sort of mainstream musicology codes, but, um, but Hollywood music codes. So in that way, I, I mm -hmm. think it's got an interesting position within that as well. Yes, thank you for that. I made sure to put that, that Quo Vadis quote from 1951, because you know, there was a lot of commentary about the, the research done to make the music sound sufficiently old enough. Um, and this is very, very new work, so I welcome lot, uh, new areas to go into. This is just, I'm, I'm scratching the surface here. Um, so I know that there are a lot of things that I have missed citations, so please send them my way. I would really appreciate that. But one of the reasons I didn't want to get too hard into the uh, the movie score is, it, it has been covered in other places, and I think, you know, Haynes describes beautifully how that score fits into the different moods of the Middle Ages and those aural symbols. So that, that's mapped 
decently well in the book, although it, it could use a little more discussion, but uh, it, it's, it's definitely something that gets touched on a lot in, in the book on music and films of the Middle Ages. Since I'm right here. Um, I just had maybe a silly question. Um, considering the kinds of medieval renaissance, pseudo medieval renaissance kind of styles that are appropriate, that seem appropriate for the NES, whether that means like ludically, um, ludically workable or just doesn't sound awful. Do you think there's a way in which, or there's an avenue in which we could learn more about those styles from investigating its workability in this particularly constrained situation? <laughs> Sure. You want to write that paper? <laughs> I want you to write it. You want me to write it. <laughs> Save yourself or the care. work. Yeah, the, the, it's interesting. Uh, one of the things that kept coming up in the discussion of the difficulty in translating to the assembly language was the, the rhythm. And that you can't really, you can, if you really labor over it, do meter changes. And there is a, a striking example of a meter change um, in the score for his melee battle theme. What did I just do? Um, but it is, at the level of the eighth note, uh, it remains constant, and so, you know, we're able to facilitate the metrical shift that way. So here's just a quick clip of that. And so it's going to shift here. And this is also a, one of the uses of the triangle channel to imply un, you know, unpitched percussion, even though it doesn't fit. Um, so that, that's also why the, I threw this slide in here, just in case. Um, so it, it, you know, there's something uh, about needing to, needing to make sure that there's some sort of metrical regularity in the music um, that I think is a, an interesting constraint here and makes it so that how would we encode chant uh, in an NES game? I've, I've, I'm just starting to learn the assembly language and the tracking programs myself, and it, it's a lot of math and yeah. <laughs> figuring out where to place the, the notes in the different cells. I don't know, just how many frames to make the note this long versus this long. It's, it, it, it's quite a process, so it is a lot easier if you know the eighth note is gonna be this many frames every single time. Hmm? Uh, well, it's, it's coming at it from the back end. Uh, in my other work for my dissertation, I've hit moments where I'm unable to transcribe something because it's not, uh, it's not behaving the way I expect it to, rhythmically in particular, and so then I started digging through the source code with Kevin Burke's help. Thank you, Kevin, I, if you're watching the stream, um, to, to kind of see what was happening behind the scenes. So it was just a, my, my sense of wanting to know exactly what's going on here. I think we should probably move on to the next paper, owing that we started a little bit late. So thank you so much, Dana. Thank you.